Hello, everybody. My name is Le Tien Fung. I'm a senior product manager at Amazon EC2. It's really great to see everybody here. It's really exciting to see how many people are interested in learning more about how to run massively parallel compute-intensive workload in AWS. Compute performance is critical for the, application, for the performance of an application. So today, we're going to talk about how to accelerate your application using hardware accelerations. Together with me are Puyang Jahani, director at Arm Benfield, and Oliver Kunasikara, CEO and co-founder at NG Codec. They'll be with me on the stage to share the experience moving workloads to hardware accelerators uh, in, to AWS. As many of you have already noticed yesterday in Andy's keynote, we just announced a preview of our first FPGA product, F1 instance. This is the fourth uh, accelerated computing instance we have introduced. So if you're interested in it, you can sign up online for the preview. In this session, I would like to give you an overview of what is hardware acceleration, talk about the hardware acceleration on AWS, provide some example use cases of hardware acceleration, and discuss how to choose the right hardware accelerator. At the end of the session, I'll conclude by sharing some of our best practices when using P2 and F1 instances. When we talk about compute intensive workloads, for example, virtual reality, when you have to stitch multiple things together, or fluid dynamics, we need to simulate movement of liquids using thousands of millions of particles, or genomics, when you want to match a long DNA sequence with a template, your first reaction would probably be, let me get a lot of CPUs. In the AWS, you have multiple ways of doing it. For batch workloads, you may create a large spot fleet of C4 instances, or maybe C5 next year. Spot instances really give you some very good characteristics. It gives you a very effective way of running hundreds of instances when you need to quickly scale out your workload. There are a lot of features you can leverage using spots. For example, you can set the bid price to control budget. You can use spot fleet to manage a pool of uh, spot capacities. Or you can use spot block for defined durational workloads. While spot is a good way for getting a lot of CPU power, I think we can do better. There are many motivations to accelerate your workloads. And let, let us look at them one by one. The first one is some workloads are practically impossible to run on CPU only. It can probably take weeks. For example, if you want to train a large deep, uh, deep neural network models, it can probably take weeks, months, or even years when running on pure, purely on CPUs. The second one is you want to reduce the execution latency. For example, real-time speech recognition. You don't want you to talk to the application and then give you a response 30 seconds later. And, th and third motivation is that you want to optimize for price performance. For example, molecule dynamics, when you want to screen as many molecules as possible for drug discovery with using limited budget. So we believe there is a way to solve all these problems. That is using hardware acceleration. So what is hardware acceleration? Hardware acceleration is used of specialized hardware, we call it hardware accelerators, to perform some functions more efficiently than in software running on CPUs. Hardware acceleration is not really a new concept. In 1980s, Intel introduced Intel 8087, which is a floating point coprocessor for the 8086 lines of CPUs. Nowadays, there are much more hardware accelerators available on the market. You can have GPUs for rendering graphics. You can have other hardware accelerators to encrypt network traffic, speak, speed up file compression, or even you can accelerate Bitcoin mining using hardware accelerators. So although these jobs can be done on software running on CPUs, hardware accelerators are available that you can do it much more faster and much more efficiently uh, in, in hardware accelerators. The analogy I would like to draw between CPU and hardware accelerators is Swiss Army knife versus egg slicers. CPU is like Swiss Army knife. It's very versatile. You can do a lot of things. For example, you can do integer calculations, floating point calculations, logical operations, control flow. Many, many, basically all the compute workloads you can, vert, you, can, you can run on CPUs. Just like in Swiss Army Knife, you can cut papers, open bottles, work on screwdrivers. You may even use Swiss Army Knife to cut a tree if you want. Hardware accelerators, on the other hand, are like egg slicers. You can only do a limited set of work. For example, egg slicers can only slice eggs. You may occasionally use it to slice uh, mushrooms, but you de definitely cannot use to cut a tree. However, if you want to cut eggs every day, like hundreds of eggs every day, like a salad chef, it's much more efficient using egg slicers than using Swiss Army Knife to compute the job. So the same applies to hardware acceleration versus CPU for these repetitive compute intensive workloads, such as matrix operations or Monte Carlo simulations. Some of our customers 
are able to use how accelerators to speed up their workload by 78 times compared to running workloads on CPU. And that's very impressive. So although there's a lot of how accelerators on market, the two types of accelerators that are widely available and widely used, that is GPU and FPGA. With the development of HPC and deep learning, GPU is now at the center stage of accelerated computing. It's no longer just for graphics, can use for a wide range of compute intensive workloads. So why GPU is so popular? We believe that is for several reasons. First one, GPUs are very widely available. It's available to high scale, uh, at high scale to application developers worldwide. Basically, all your laptops or your PCs have a GPU inside, be it from NVIDIA, AMD, or Intel. You don't have to move mountains just to get access to one GPU. Secondly, it enables high degree of par data parallelism. So in one GPU, you can probably have thousands of parallel processing cores, while in CPU, you can probably just get 20 or 30 cores. And in GPU, there is very good characteristic, which is called uh, SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. It can run a single instruction on a lot, multiple data to speed up the workload. And it's redesigned for high floating point arithmetic because GPU started to support uh, graphics workloads, which are all about uh, uh, floating point performance. And there, is, there are a lot of consistent, well-documented set of APIs, for example, CUDA and OpenCL. A lot of people are using, using these APIs to develop applications. It creates a good ecosystem and a positive feedback loop so that these APIs are currently supported by a wide range of ISVs and developers and open source frameworks around the world. So some people may ask, we already have a large application that is running on CPUs. Would it take a, lot, a long time for us to migrate from CPU to GPU? One beauty of GPU is that it allows you to optimize some core code, mostly inner loops, for example, uh, as shown on, on, the, on the screen. It, that's probably maybe 10% or 5% of your code for GPU optimization, and you can get multiple times speed up. You can keep the rest as is. Most of the codes in your application is probably open in a file, draw some graphs, uh, draw a button on the, on the screen, or maybe handling network traffic, handling errors, do some logical control flows. These operations do not really benefit from GPUs. All you need to do is just to optimize the inner loops, for example, matrix operations uh, and Monte Carlo simulations, and offload these most time-consuming parts of your applications to GPUs. And you can use minimal investment to get maximum return. FPGAs, on the other hand, provide you some additional benefits. For example, it allows you to make custom hardware for specific algorithms. There's no instruction set or data structure defining FPGA, so you can define your own. For example, if you want to run an application that the algorithm works best with 15 bits, you cannot do it in CPU or GPU, but you can easily do it in FPGA. If you want to create your own opcode, no problem. And FPGA is a reprogrammable hardware which gives you flexibility to reconfigure the gates to suit your needs. You can live upgrade these uh, algorithms in FPGA. You don't have to refabricate a chip, which is very expensive, which is a very expensive process. FPGA also supports the concept of data flow programming. You input the data on one side, push it to a series of gates, and then you can get the result on the other side. Unlike GPU, which is good for independent stream calculations, for FPGA, you can really have applications that, are, that requires high interdependence between threads. This is something that you can't achieve easily uh, in GPU. And FPGA also offers a large local memory and high memory bandwidth. So with all these benefits, you will be able to run your workload much faster and much more cost effectively. So let me draw an analogy between uh, GPU and FPGA. That's usually how I like to compare and contrast, uh, contrast them. So for GPU, it's really like a highway. You can have multiple lanes. Each lane accommodates a line of cars. These cars are driving their own lanes unless you, you want to switch lanes. And there's no interdependencies. You can, you can, over, you can bypass the other cars. It's not a problem. At toll booths, each lane has its own operation, which is collect tolls. And everybody has to pay tolls. And th there's only one operation. You can increase the throughput by easily adding more lanes. FPGA is more like assembly lines. You input raw materials on one side, and you can configure an assembly line based on the algorithms. But at any given moment, you can have multiple operations on multiple stages of the data, just like in Toyota assembly line. You can have somebody installing the engine. You can have somebody installing the wheels at the same time. No problem. 
You can, of course, make FPGA data parallel, but you're not required to do so. So in AWS, we are offering both type of accelerators. We started our accelerator compute instance family back in 2010 when we introduced CG1 instance with a pair of NVIDIA Tesla M2050 Fermi GPUs. And in 2013, we upgraded CG1 to G2 instance with NVIDIA K520 GPUs. I believe uh, some of you may still be running your workloads on uh, G2 instances. You can also run, uh, you can run DirectX, uh, OpenGL code, and OpenCL code on uh, G2. We just launched P2 instance with NVIDIA K80 GPUs back in September this year, actually September, uh, end of September. P2 instance supports up to 16 GPUs in one single instance, and it supports GPU Direct, so the GPUs can talk to each other without going through CPUs. On the FPGA side, we just announced the preview of F1 instance yesterday, which was up to eight Xilinx FPGAs. And we continue innovating. We want to really bring the best hardware accelerators to, to uh, satisfy your needs. So why, why should you choose hardware acceleration on AWS? So AWS provides you a lot of cloud benefits. First of all, it's easy to use. EC2 instance allows you developers, ISVs, and end users to quickly develop and run your application. You can start using GPUs and FPGAs within minutes. You can literally just have a credit card, sign up account, and you can start using G2, P2, or F1. Secondly, uh, it's flex flexibility. We allows you to select whatever, uh, multiple types of hardware accelerators, operating systems, program language based on your needs. If you want to use Direct, uh, if you want uh, CUDA on P2 today and want to switch FPGA tomorrow, no problem. You don't have to buy any of these chips. You just want, to, you can just start your instance on AWS. You also have the, have the options to run from one, inst one accelerator to up to 16 accelerators in one single host. The third one is scalability. Your application can spin up resource on demand within minutes. We have a massive infrastructure back in AWS and you have access to compute resource when you need them. This is very beneficial once, when you want to run batch processing workloads, such as deep learning trainings, where you need massive compute resource for a short period of time. And the last one is cost effectiveness. Instead of buying your own GPUs, you can, you can, you can get P2 instances on demand uh, in North Virginia for 90 cents per hour. And you can use spot instances to access your, uh, our spare EC2 capacities at very low cost. You can also buy reserve instance to guarantee that you have the enough capacity when you need them and receive a lot of discount on them. FPGA development has historically been a very huge undertaking. If you come from double E background, you probably remember the days when you have to get a development board, plug into a computer, and install a lot of tools to program these FPGA boards. There are a lot of setup works you need to do before you can even write the first line of FPGA code. We simplified this process of FPGA development and handled all the undifferentiated heavy lifting for you. We provide you a hardware development kit, which helps you develop your hardware acceleration very quickly. The hardware development kit, we call HDK, includes code samples, compile scripts, debug interface, and many other tools that you need to develop FPGA code for F1 instance. You can use HDK either in AWS provided Army or on your on-premise development environment. We also have FPGA developer army for free uh, on the AWS Marketplace. The, F, the, the developer army includes a prepackaged tool development environment with scripts and tools for simulating the FPGA design, compiling codes, and building and registering your AFI, which, is, which stands for Amazon FPGA Image. You can deploy the FPGA developer army on Amazon EC2 instance and provision the resource you need when you write and test your FPGA instance. So, I want to talk a little bit about all the use cases that we, we think that are suitable for hardware accelerations. For GPU, it's particularly good for machine learnings, engineering simulations, financial simulations, virtual reality, in-memory database, rendering, transcoding. As some of, you may, some of you may have noticed yesterday that we have Verizon on stage talk about running virtual reality workloads on GPUs. For FPGA, we're mainly targeting genomics, security analytics, big data analytics and search, video encoding, financial simulation, cryptography, data compression, and chip simulation acceleration. So for machine learnings, deep learning techniques such as convolutional neural network requires a lot of floating point calculations. 
you need to extract features and multiple layers, and these operations are easily parallelizable. So it's a very great candidate for accelerated computing, as you can see uh, f f from the uh, flow diagram uh, of, of deep learning. And we believe engineering simulation will be also a very great candidate. We have a customer, ATER, which provides uh, simulation softwares. And you can see they are simulating uh, the fluid's movement uh, using uh, particle-based simulations. And they actually get very good results. They said they're able to leverage the massive amount of aggregate GPU memory and double precision floating point performance in P2 instance in a single node and significantly reduce customer simulation times and reduce the cost of running the large simulations. So far, we have discussed two use cases of GPUs. Now I'd like to invite Puyang Jahani to share his experience using GPUs to accelerate financial risk simulation. Puyang is the director at On Benefield. He's the head of Passwise risk management products that include financial models and softwares that run on high-performance GPU computing grid. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Ladian, for the great introduction, and thank you, everyone, for uh, spending the time with us. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, uh, presenting our use cases to you. So um, I'll get right to the material. Um, so uh, we've been early adopters of GPUs since uh, 2010. Um, what I'll be sharing with you is our experiences with uh, uh, accelerated hardware for computational finance, especially GPUs. Um, in the life insurance industry. So uh, what is Pathwise? Pathwise currently is the fastest and most scalable financial risk management solution for uh, insurance companies. And um, the computational capabilities that GPUs have been able to offer us, uh, we've been able to migrate a lot of clients from traditional legacy systems that were CPU-based. And they've been seeing improvements in the order of 50 to 300x. So if you want to put it in perspective, 300x means reducing runtime from two weeks down to an hour. So that's, uh, let's say, quite impressive. And um, also, our platform is a complete um, risk management solution. So what our clients are normally doing is they're using a lot of disjoint siloed systems. And they actually migrate to Pathwise. And now they have one high performance uh, system that can actually do everything for them, uh, reporting, uh, capital calculations, reserve calculations, hedging, risk management, you name it. It's basically one uh, complete solution for, for their needs, and it's uh, GPU-powered, and uh, we'll discuss how we're uh, thinking of uh, using FPGAs uh, uh, in the coming months. And, um, so basically, at a broad level, many of the compute-intensive uh, calculations that are done in finance it can be categorized into um, two different uh, buckets. Well, this is our um, categorization. Um, other people might actually um, categorize them differently, but we, um, and this maps into how Pathwise actually uh, treats these calculations. So we um, have a set of calculations that are deterministic. These are mostly close form calculations. Um, if you're familiar with like option pricing, the Black-Scholes formula, you know it's a close form uh, formula. and uh, uh, so you can actually, using uh, data parallelism, you can actually run thousands of uh, these calculations in, 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 in parallel. And uh, also um, pricing uh, simple instruments like vanilla interest rate swaps, um, which are not uh, stochastic in nature, they can also be done. Um, so we can actually send a job, um, calculate, I don't know, a million different interest rate swaps for me, you send it to GPU and the GPUs. Um, perfectly uh, well suited for, for these kinds of calculations. And then the other category are the Monte Carlo simulations that uh, I guess everyone's familiar with. So these are done for stochastic uh, calculations uh, where there's a random element. And uh, this is used for pricing exotic options, complicated options where, I'm not going to get into detail, but, um, uh, and also complex uh, insurance products that don't have any closed form solution. You have to basically solve a partial differential equation a stochastic differential equation, and there is no way to calculate this in a, uh, there's no closed form formula for this. And also this other um, major problem uh, that a lot of life insurance companies are facing, it's called the stochastic and stochastic calculations. These are basically, uh, as you know, Monte Carlo simulations are already hard enough. So these are, these stochastic and stochastic calculations are 
uh, Monte Carlo simulations inside other Monte Carlo simulations. So um, you can imagine how complicated that can get. Um, being able to um, handle such a calculation in a risk management software is already quite a big accomplishment. Uh, a lot of uh, solutions cannot do this. There are a lot of approximations that are made, uh, least squares Monte Carlo, uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, that's beyond the scope of this talk. Um, and then being able to do such a calculation in a realistic uh, amount of time uh, or acceptable amount of time, that will be like the holy grail uh, for the life insurance business. Um, here I'm just going to outline briefly what kind of, what's the magnitude of the problem we're dealing with. Um, we're doing a Monte Carlo simulation projection over 30 years, so monthly projection, time steps are monthly, so 12 times 30, about 360 time steps. That's the horizontal axis. We have an outer loop for uh, Monte Carlo simulation, so those are like a thousand scenarios, say, a thousand scenarios. And then each of these thousand scenarios at each time point we're doing another inner loop calculations. Um, so there's another Monte Carlo calculation happening there. So um, typically, sometimes we use like 5,000 scenarios for that to get actually to the exact value. Um, you see this number 30 shocks. Um, shocks are actually used for sen sensitivity analysis. So we're actually calculating finance, finite difference uh, you're using sensitivities, using finance, finite difference methods. So these are basically um, calculating what our uh, product, what its sensitivity is to movements in the market. Um, stock market goes up and down. Interest rates go up and down. Volatility goes up and down. We're trying to determine what's the sensitivity. So we have to use like a finance, finite difference uh, method for that. Uh, we use like shocks up and shocks down, so we get like a two-sided uh, find a difference, so that get, provides uh, more accurate results. So if you add this all up together, you'll see there's 54 billion valuations that need to be done for, for and this is just for one policy. Um, so these are not 54 billion instructions or calculations, these are valuations, and each valuation we're calculating lapse and mortality. These are uh, actuarial models that are used to determine whether a policyholder wants to stick with the product or once you leave, or God forbid, the policyholder passes away. Um, also, um, we're using stochastic uh, differential equations and stochastic processes to calculate how the um, indices, the stock indices are moving, uh, how the interest rates are moving. So there's a lot of uh, calculations going on in the background, um, as you can see. Um, and multiply that by 100,000 or 1 million policies, you'll see like, what kind of, what, what's the scale of the problem really is. Um, so, obviously, uh, you can't use CPUs for this. Um, and uh, basically, we have a limited number of cores, and uh, they're not well suited for parallel calculations. So, what is good? Obviously, uh, if you look at Flint's tax taxonomy of uh, different architectures, the SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. Here we have an architecture with a no large number of cores, fast memory bandwidth. And uh, so it allows us to calculate thousands of path scenarios in parallel. And uh, so basically, you're use, running the same instructions, but on different uh, source data. And now modern uh, GPUs, like the NVIDIA's latest families, they're taking that one step further with the SIMT architecture. So basically, um, what they're trying to do is basically emulate the MIMD multiple instruction, multiple data, architecture in a single instruction multiple data um, architecture. So now it has all the benefits of SIMD and on top of that we have like, uh, we can do, we can achieve higher level of parallelization through multiple flow paths. Um, so we didn't start with GPUs. Um, I joined the company in 2010. Our group started in 2008. So back then, um, our software developers were using the cell processor. So uh, that's the processor that uh, was used on the PlayStation 3, if you remember, developed by Sony, Toshiba, and IBM. And, uh, but then abruptly, it was discontinued in 2009 uh, without it giving any reasons. Um, so uh, personally, fortunately, I haven't had experience programming, but talking to her, our software developers, they said it was extremely difficult to program, it was a nightmare. Uh, they weren't too happy about it. And uh, well, disadvantage was specialized hardware, um, extremely difficult to program and completely suddenly discontinued on then. On the other hand, we have uh, GPUs. They're nice commodity hardware. 
uh, widely available. Uh, they've been used for, I don't know, as long as I remember, like on every PC has, a, every laptop, every phone, everything has a GPU in it. So it's proven technology. Um, uh, and uh, it's great that NVIDIA is providing such great supports. Um, they're CUDA platform. Uh, we're really happy about using that. It's, and they're constantly improving it. Uh, they're coming up with new families. Uh, the latest one, the Pascal family that was introduced early this year. Um, every generation, they're doubling the performance. Um, so, uh, and the other thing is we did some initial benchmarking uh, on uh, GPUs back in 2010. Uh, it was the C2050, the same ones that uh, Leighton mentioned that were in the CG1 uh, instances that uh, Amazon had. And uh, we actually saw like 150-fold <clears throat> improvement using uh, the C2050s uh, versus the best and fastest Xeon processors back then. Uh, so that was basically an obvious choice for us to go with GPUs. And uh, also the great thing is that uh, we get GPUs that are widely available on Amazon AWS. Um, so these are the, so makes GPUs the clear favorite for us right now. And um, this basically, this is the last slide. So um, you're wondering how is our system used? Like how many software engineers do you need? These models are constantly changing. You're coming up with new strategies for risk management or you're coming up with new requirements, new reports, a whole bunch of new calculations are happening. So um, what's needed? Um, a lot of actuaries that use the system, they're not software developers. Uh, the quantitative analysts, they might be more um, familiar with software development, but uh, the great thing is that uh, all the business logic, everything, all the models are actually implemented in a spreadsheet-like interface. So if you know how to use Excel, you know how to use our tools. So uh, we've developed our own uh, domain-specific language, the Pathwise modeling language. So all the logic is actually implemented in there. And they're basically simple constructs like min, max, if, average, sum, uh, stuff that everyone is familiar with uh, from Excel. Um, so that's how the logic is actually implemented. And with the press of a button, um, the logic is actually converted into uh, CUDA and you can actually uh, deploy to, to grid. And um, you can see that um, our model language is nicely isolated from all the uh, lower layers. So it can actually talk to CUDA, you can actually run it on NVIDIA GPUs, um, you can um, generate OpenCL code, uh, run it on GPUs or CPUs, and uh, we're actually working on um, supporting FPGAs right now. So that can be done either using OpenCL or using a tool that converts the, the logic into HDL. And we're actually very excited about the announcement yesterday. Um, that's gonna uh, make things much easier for us to support FPGAs. Uh, I worked at uh, Altura FPGA company for seven years myself and, and I know how um, gruesome it is to get a FPGA card working and now uh, Amazon's doing all the work for us, so really happy about that, and that's going to simplify our roadmap for FPGA support uh, quite a bit. And uh, so thank you very much for your time, and uh, this concludes my part. Thank you. All right. Thank you, very, thank you very much, uh, Poyan, for the sharing. The 150 times uh, speed up is truly impressive. It's great to see that also uh, PWML can run on both GPUs and F FPGAs. It demonstrates that the similar, similar to GPU, FPGA can also have high potential and very wide use cases in accelerated computing. One of our focus areas of FPGA is video encoding. Now I'd like to turn it over to Oliver Gunasikara, CEO and co-founder of NG Codec to talk about using cloud FPGA acceleration for live video encoding. Oliver has 20 years of mobile experience, have been responsible for ARM's mobile activities starting 1995. He spent 12 years with ARM, serving as a VP for corporate biz dev, and M&A until 2007. Prior to co-founding NG Codec in 2012, he was a business development consultant to a number of mobile startups in the OS, security, imaging, and battery areas. Oliver, please. Great, well, it's uh, super exciting to be here, and thank you to, uh, to Amazon for this opportunity. 
Um, our team has been working extremely hard to, to really bring together FPGAs and the cloud, and I'm really excited to actually try and attempt a live demo of an F1 instance uh, in a few minutes. So let me move forward by giving you a little bit of background on uh, our company. We're a small company, we're a startup, we're about 15 people. Uh, we were founded about four years ago, uh, primarily from uh, a small super angel and Xilinx. So Xilinx is the company that makes the FPGAs, uh, they're the market leader, and they're the ones that uh, we're demonstrating and Amazon has deployed on the F1 instance. Uh, our technology is really around low latency video encoding, specifically the next generation, which is called H.265, which can half the bit rate uh, for the same quality as H.264. So it's pretty compelling. Uh, we have, as I said, about 15 people. We have a lot of experience of designing hardware uh, and specifically video, and we have some patents, and we're based in, in Sunnyvale. So first of all, I wanted to set the stage for the problem. The problem we see is that there is a massive tsunami coming to video workloads, and it's coming because of basically three things. The first thing is that everyone is consuming vastly more video than they did in the past. You know, everyone is, is streaming video, live video, looking at things. People don't want to read, they want to watch a video. And, and so the growth is just massive. Cisco estimates that video is growing at about 31% uh, compoundly every year. That's a massive, massive amount of video that is just being consumed and has to be encoded and analyzed and delivered. And that's a problem because it's growing so fast. Secondly, everybody wants higher quality video. People want video not at standard def, not even an H def, high definition. They want ultra high definition. They want 4K. They want 10 bits. They want HDR. They want high frame rate. They want wide color graphic, color gamma. They want really super high quality. They want 360 video. They want VR. They want 8K. This again is putting massive demands on infrastructure that needs to encode and process all of that video. Thirdly, because the amount of video is increasing and the quality is increasing, we have to do something about the compression. Because if we use the legacy H.264, which everyone uses today, it's over 12 years old, it's just not efficient. We can, with this new standard that was ratified a few years ago, half the bit rate for the same quality. But there's a caveat. It needs up to 10 times more compute to achieve that half the bit rate. So you need 10 times more CPUs at the same resolution and frame rate as you did for H.264. So you put all these three together, and we think existing infrastructure is completely overloaded. And, and so the message is we need a new accelerator. We cannot do this on CPUs and GPUs. We just cannot keep up. And so we think FPGAs are the right approach. Now, what I wanted to do was kind of position them at a high level of where we think they fit on the range between CPUs and custom accelerators or ASICs. And so on my axes on the bottom, I'm showing how efficient is an implementation, how fast it is, uh, how much power consumption does it take. And so obviously to the right, you have a custom ASIC, like the chip that is in your smartphone. That's super efficient. It has amazing performance, super low power, but it was designed three years before you got it in your pocket and it's fixed, it cannot be changed. It, they commit the, the masks and it gets made. So on the flexibility and ease of use, it's really, really tough and difficult, so it's the worst. But it has the most efficiency, so it's great for consumer products like smartphones. On the other extreme is we have the classic CPU. The CPU, ultimate flexibility, everyone loves that. We can run code on it, <coughs> any language, very, very efficient, very mature. But from a performance and power consumption, many orders of magnitude less efficient. In the middle is GPUs. GPUs are a little bit better than CPUs, maybe an order of magnitude better, but not two or three or four orders of magnitude. 
but a little bit harder to program. You have to use CUDA or OpenCL. You have to describe your parallel data structures. You have to also work with the CPU because GPUs on their own typically don't work. It's a CPU-GPU combined solution because you have to make decisions. But definitely more efficient. But the new area is FPGAs. FPGAs have much more performance, in our view, an order of magnitude more performance than GPUs because we can program them at the gate level. We can actually wire them up differently based on the design as opposed to running software, which is what runs on a CPU and GPU. But they are harder to program. You have to use what's called RTL or use a tool that generates RTL. So it's a little bit more complex. You have to understand double E and hardware design. So they're definitely harder to use, but they are field programmable, meaning you can download a new image each time and change it. So they're definitely a lot more flexible. And so we think for cloud acceleration, specifically for video, FPGAs make the most sense. So. What I'd like to do now is actually go to a live demo. Now, this is pretty risky, I must say, because we are the first people to use the F1 instance. And we only got access to the F1 instance uh, actually on Monday. Uh, we started this project three weeks ago. And so Monday, 5 p.m., we got the first access to the F1 instance. Now, we have had massive support from, uh, let me switch the video. Yeah, so it's working. So what, what we're seeing here is the video that is coming live from this smartphone. It's being sent to Amazon's data center we are decoding the video on the CPU, and then we are sending the decoded video to the F1 instance. We're running our encoder, H.265, so we're converting the H.264 to H.265. We're half the bit rate, and then we're streaming it back to the computer here. And we're doing all of that live now on the internet. There's quite a bit of latency. We still have some optimizations to do, uh, I would say that this is really a moonshot. The, the team has been working incredibly hard, and not only our team. Um, we've had great support from the Amazon folks uh, in, in Austin. And you know, we, we were working over Thanksgiving in the office, but so were they. So we were having calls on, on the Friday, for instance, of Thanksgiving with the Amazon team to get all of this done. So, Massive, massive amount of uh, effort that has gone into pull this off in three weeks. But it's live. It's working. We're using the F1 instance to basically half the bit rate. So really happy that that worked. It was uh, <laughs> touch and go whether, whether we would. But um, super happy about this. And again, this is a world first. I think we're the first people to use the F1 instance anywhere on the planet So as, as an external company. So really, really happy. So let me switch back to the slides and let me sum up. OK, so this, this was the demo that I just showed you. So the live stream went from the iPhone in H.264 and 5 megabits into the Amazon F1 instance, where it was decoded initially and then re-encoded with our encoder to H.265, and then streamed back to the PC uh, on, on the desk. And the key here is that we are halving the bit rate. Uh, so yeah, great that that worked. First, First, as I said, this is live. No one else has ever used the F1 right now. OK, so let me summarize from our specific point of view how we see FPGAs, CPUs, and GPUs fitting together for video encoding. So obviously, when you talk about video quality for live, you're constrained. Because with a live use case, you have to be able to process that within your frame rate. And so you cannot 
use every single instance that you can afford. You have real constraints. And so the reality is that if you use, say, x265, which is the open source uh, codec for CPUs, you have to run with a preset that is fast, that doesn't offer great quality. It offers quality broadly similar to H.264 in its high quality setting. But if you use GPUs, you can achieve higher quality. And so some folks do that. Um, and of course, with our FPGA, we can also achieve extremely high quality for live. But when it comes to latency, again, software has quite a bit of an overhead. But with GPUs, there's even more overhead because you have to split the design between CPU and GPU. But with an FPGA, we can do ultra low latency. Not shown here because we haven't tuned it, but ultimately we can get down to subframe levels of latency, both encode and decode. And, and so when you talk about the cost, because we need less resources, we believe the FPGAs will be considerably lower cost than using GPUs or CPUs. Now, the, the caveat is, you know, we have worked on building our encoder over the last 18 months. So we had it running in an FPGA and we ported it into the F1 instance. So it takes quite a large effort to get this up and running. But once it's there, we plan to have it available in the Amazon marketplace for, for people to make use of. So just to, to summarize, we did this port in three weeks. We're the first people to do it. Uh, teams have worked round the clock. Uh, I'm really, really happy and amazed that we, we pulled it off. We got amazing support from, from Amazon as well. Uh, we believe a single F1 instance will be able to do 4K30, and we can put, there are up to eight of these FPGAs available, and so we can chain them together to go to higher quality, like 8K or 360 video as needed. Uh, we believe that we can have significantly higher video quality, meaning at a certain bit rate, we will have substantially higher quality or need lower bit rate than other encoders. And remember, the encoder is up to each vendor, so no two encoders are the same. It's only the decoders that are standardized. And then finally, ultra low latency allows us to enable brand new use cases. And this is my last slide. So an example of a brand new use case is what we call cloud virtual reality or augmented reality. Now in cloud virtual reality, the actual computing, the game or the AR or the VR experience, the whole graphics, all runs in the cloud. And you just deliver an ultra low latency video feed back to the consumer. Now it needs a low latency network right to the end consumer. It needs uh, a located network uh, data center that is not geographically too far away because we do have the speed of light issues. But if you can achieve that, you can ultimately have an Optimus Rift game experience on a $100 HMD and just pay per use as you use it in the cloud. And we think that's going to be game changing because it will also mean much lower uh, power consumption. And in the future of AR, we think you'll be able to have an AR experience where you use the whole AWS supercomputer to drive the AR, and yet you have a very low cost, low power consumption, head mounted device that just enables the future. So that's all I have here. Thank you again for the opportunity. Super excited, and let me hand back. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for Oliver for the nice presentation. It's actually the first public demo of F1 instance I've ever seen. All right, so we've now seen a lot of uh, use cases of using hardware accelerations. On one aspect, we want to identify what is the right hardware accelerator for use case. On the other hand, we also make sure that we can get the most out of from these accelerators. So with that, I would like to share some best practices when we use P2 and F1 instances. First of all, we provide a lot of armies, prepackaged machine images. So for example, if you want to run a deep learning workload, the best army you can find on AWS is the AWS Deep Learning Army. After we launched P2, I've received a lot of uh, customer questions around how can I best 
start using P2 for deep learning. We have to install NVIDIA drivers, we have to install CUDA, we have to install CUDNN, we have to install MXNet, TensorFlow, uh, Torch, all these frameworks. So the deep learning army packaged all these softwares into one place. So you don't need to uh, go through all these manual steps. You just launch instance with this army and you're good to go. The second army I want to talk about is FPGA de de developer army. So it gives you a lot, of tool uh, a lot of tools to simplify development on FPGAs. So FPGA uh, F1 instance now in preview. If you sign up, uh, we'll get back to you on, on getting preview instance. Also like to talk about some general system tuning, uh, tuning tips. First of all, we recommend keep Linux kernel up to date, at least 3.10 or above. We have customers running on uh, uh, kernel 2.2.x version, and once they upgrade, they see a 30% to 40% performance increase uh, by, just by changing the kernels. If you, if you really care about network performance, we'd like, to use, we like you, you to use enhanced networking or elastic network adapter for best networking performance. And you can use placement groups to achieve the maximum network bandwidth within the cluster of instances. These are all uh, publicly available uh, in EC2. And if, you, if your application pull, uh, clock, uh, posts a clock very frequently, we rec recommend using TSC clock, uh, clock source. And because for P2 and F1 instances, we have large, um, large memory uh, in, in the host, you can fully utilize the host memory to cache hot data. So you don't have to put data as code uh, in EBS or in S S3. You can just put all these data if, it, if they fit in, uh, in the host memory. And then Amazon Linux is fully optimized for P2 and F1 instances, uh, and we strongly recommend you using uh, Amazon Linux. And there are some NVIDIA driver settings for P2 instances. For example, a lot of people migrate their workload from G2 to P2, and they don't upgrade the, the GPU drivers. So for P2 to perform, you really need NVIDIA driver at minimum of 352.99 uh, or above to use the GPU direct capabilities. And you also want to enable persistence mode by running NVIDIA SMI command. If you, if you observe, if you don't run this command, you'll probably observe uh, a, a long delay when, when, when you type this command because the driver has to initialize itself. And then you can set the clock speed at maximum uh, frequency. You can also enable or disable turbo for burst performance or high consistency. All of these can be done through NVIDIA SMI command. And we'd like to talk about data transfer between memory and, CPU, uh, and GPUs. Basically, uh, memcopy is a must-do for almost virtually all applications. And you really want to minimize the number of data, uh, minimize data transfer between host memory and GPUs because PCIe bandwidth is lower than local memory bandwidth, and you, you want to make sure that the data is memory local to the processor. And we recommend bulk, com bulk copy before uh, processing. So, because each CUDA mem copy has overheads, and if, if you have a two-dimensional or three-dimensional array, you can use CUDA mem copy 2D or 3D when copying high-dimensional arrays, instead of using a loop to, to, and, and use CUDA mem copy. And then, it's much, you get much better performance if you transfer from paint host memory to GPU, and it's, it's faster than transfer from pageable host memory. So this is example, uh, the, the benchmark results, if we copy 128 mega, uh, megabytes of data uh, from host memory to uh, GPU memory. If we just copy into one uh, quarter map copy core, it takes about 22 milliseconds. If you divide it into 32,000 chunks, it takes you uh, almost 81 milliseconds. So that is because for each quarter map copy, there's overhead. And this example shows you that uh, to copy me uh, memory from the pinnable, uh, from paint host memory to pa uh, and from pageable host memory uh, to GPUs. So the, the memory bandwidth, you, you'll see a, approximately about a 15 to 20% difference if you, if you copy from uh, paint memory uh, to GPUs. And the last thing we want to talk about is GPU Direct. So P2 instance has very good features that it enables GPU peer-to-peer -peer communications. You can use high-speed DMA transfers to copy, copy data between memories of two GPUs by using CUDA mem copy peer or CUDA mem copy peer async, depending on whether you want a blocking core or non-blocking core. 
and it provides numerous style access to memory on other GPUs from within the CUDA kernels. So this is a very good feature if you want to run deep learning or high uh, HPC workloads uh, using P2 instances. With that, now we have reached the end of the session. I really appreciate you being here. I'm glad that we can talk a little bit more about how acceleration, its use cases, and best practices. I hope you can take some of the information home and think about what are the workloads you can migrate from CPU to GPU. We've got a lot of EC2 documentations, and I'll be available to answer your questions uh, after the session. So thank you very much.